the title of my message. Are you surviving or are you thriving? You know, we've all heard the phrase, a very common English kind of a proverb, which is, the grass is greener on the other side. You know, it's kind of a syndrome, the grass is greener on the other, other side syndrome. I would say a common human problem that is faced by human beings all over the world is at many times we are not satisfied uh, with what we have. We're not satisfied with where we are. There's always this constant sense of, you know, I want more, I want to experience more. And take, for example, you know, um, the people in the West um, who have lighter skin, you know, their whole ambition in life is to stay in the sun so they can darken their skin, you know, so they can get a tan. And then you take people in the East, their, go- their sole ambition in life is to stay away from the sun because they want to lighten their skin as much as possible. It's like, you know, we're never happy with what we have been given. We always want what we don't have. You know, sometimes you search for that perfect job and you find it and you start your work and then one month into your job, um, your friend gets offered a job at a similar company with a better pay. And instantly, when you hear about it, the job that you were so excited about now is meaningless to you. You don't want it. You, you want that job that your friend has because it's, we get dissatisfied very quickly. You know, I heard someone say, the grass is greener on the other side is because they water their... <laughs> That's basically what it is. It's, it's greener on the other side because they water their... Learning to be happy with what you have and learning to be content in the place that you are, it, it takes discipline. It takes a commitment of, of, of an attitude of, of really teaching yourself this, this sense of contentment with life and with where you are as well. And Paul the Apostle writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 onwards, a very well-known scripture that many of us have heard. And this is what Paul the Apostle writes, and this is what the Bible says. It says, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Paul says, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's basically the key that Paul says. I would say there's a difference between surviving and thriving. Surviving is basically you holding on uh, with hope that your rescue is, is coming. And you do the bare enough just to get by. That's what surviving is. You're just basically hanging on in there. You know, some of you are doing that with your job. You're basically hanging on to your job with the hope that the next better job is going to come quickly. And the moment it comes, you're going to let go of the job that you're in. You know, some of you are doing that with your relationships. You know, you're holding on to that boyfriend and that girlfriend. And the moment someone better seems to walk by, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to dump them the moment I come across someone a little better than this person, and I'm going to move on. You know, if you're a married person, I'm not talking to you, okay? There's no option there. And there's another phrase that we all know, the phrase that says, all that glitters is not gold. And some people, they they carry uh, their behavior from their childhood. They always want the shiny and the new thing. And once the thing that they hold in their hand loses its sheen or its shininess and it's been played with long enough, then they're ready for the next thing. They want something different. They want something new. They want something exciting. Touch your neighbor and tell them that's not how it works. You know, people who survive are ruled by their circumstances. People who survive are ruled by their circumstances. But the people who thrive rule their circumstances. You know, in your life today, you know, is it dictated by your circumstances or do you dictate your circumstances? It's basically an attitude that all of us begin to cultivate and have in our life. And I would say as a child of God, our greatest testimony is to be at peace 
regardless of our outward circumstances. That's a testimony. Do you know that? A testimony for a child of God is to be at peace regardless of the outward circumstances. Because we have a God who can command peace in the midst of the storm. And that's why the psalm is saying, he said, you know, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I'm not going to be afraid because God is with me. God's going to lead me and guide me through it as well. So you and I, in other words, you and I, we have the power to set the temperature on how our life can be or should be. You and I have the power to, to set the atmosphere for our living as well. Many of us, we're unhappy, we're frustrated because we're constantly fighting and resisting the situation and the circumstance that we currently find ourselves in. We're not happy. We're always crying out, you know, in our prayers. Why, why doesn't God hear me? Why doesn't God change my situation? You know, why am I not married yet? You know, I've tithed, I've given to the Lord. Why is my, you know, business not blessed yet? Why don't we have children yet? We're always, you know, kind of upset with God for not changing our situation and our circumstance. And many of us, we don't stop to think maybe God wanted us to be in that situation and that circumstance for a little longer. There's never an amen for those kind of hard pills to swallow. Now, if you relate to what I'm saying this morning, I want to remind you that we have a God who is sovereign and he is in full control of your life. He's sovereign. He is in full control of your life, your situation, and your circumstances. At this very moment, God is in control of your life. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then this is the faith we have that God is in control of our life as well. You know, uh, my daughter Evelyn, she rides with her grandparents uh, in their car quite a bit lately because she just likes to be with them so we let them we let her ride in the car with my dad and uh with my mom who, which is her grandparents and when she rides with them she picks up uh conversations that happen in their car and uh you know things that happen in their car she picks up on it and when she gets into our car which is my car she begins to repeat some of the things that she has learned in my grandparents car Basically, what she does is, as soon as she sits in, our car, in my car, she says, Daddy, don't go so fast. <laughs> Daddy, please drive safely and carefully. You know, and just for the record, I am a very careful driver. <laughs> I drive well within the posted speed limits of this city. I have not exceeded it. I have yet to get a ticket in this city. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> so when my daughter sits in my car and tells me how to drive, I respond to her and I say, Evelyn, as long as you're seated in my car and I'm driving, you just look out the window and be at peace because daddy knows what he's doing. And some of you, you need to hear that from God. God's saying to you, my child, if you're going to trust me with your life, I'm going to direct you and I'm going to direct your step. You be at peace. Because I know what I'm doing in your life. You just enjoy the scenery. Look out, out the window and enjoy the journey of where you are as I'm getting you to where you need to be as well. Some of us, we're so concerned with what God is doing in our life. We're so concerned what he's not doing in our life. And God says, that's not your problem. If you've entrusted your life to me, then I will take care of you. And I will do what's best for your life as well. What I want from you is to be relaxed. Put your seatbelt on. Come on, someone. Put your seatbelt on, and when you put your seatbelt on, just relax. Because God knows what he's doing. He knows how to get you to where you need to be. He knows how long it's going to take as well. And your job and my job is like what the pilot says, sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. Tell your neighbor, sit back, relax, and enjoy the flights. That's what God wants us to do. He says, when I'm in control of your life, you relax. Now, I'm aware that some of you, have situations and circumstances that are really difficult and, and the challenges that, that you're facing may truly be overwhelming and you're saying, you know, uh, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through, you know. We all want things to change in our life. We want things to happen sooner. But if we really believe that God is in control and that God is directing our steps, then we must believe 
that we are exactly where God wants us to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you believe that God is directing your step, that means today, on the 2nd of February, 2020, you are exactly where God wants you to be, nowhere else, because God is in control of your life. You know, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not advocating a passive life where you go around saying, you know, okay, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be. Uh, you know, that's not what I'm saying. We should rebuke the enemy. We should resist sickness and the attacks that the enemy brings to steal our joy. But that does not mean every minute of our waking life we need to be fighting and struggling all the time. Not everything is an attack from the devil. Not every cough and every rash is from the pit of hell. Not every financial setback is an attack from the devil. For the devil to be attacking you, you first need to be on his radar doing some damage to his kingdom. You're not doing anything to do, you know, bug him. He's not even going to bug your life. A lot of times the troubles that we face is a, is a product of our own foolishness. Things that we have done, places we have gone, or things that we're experiencing could be part of our bad decision making. Not everything needs to be blamed on the devil. Sometimes Christians give the devil too much credit. The devil's like, I didn't do that, but thank you. I shall take that credit as well. Yes, your life is a mess because of me. No, no, sometimes our life is a mess because we are not walking in wisdom and making the right decisions. Come on, someone. There, is, there are things that we go through that God allows us to go through as well because he's allowing us to go through a process where he's doing something in our life, in our character as well. And sometimes people wear themselves out fighting everything. Fighting every situation, fighting every circumstance they're in. They're always, you know, fighting, oh, I don't want to, I don't like this, I don't want that, I don't want to be here, oh, I don't want to go there, I don't want to do this, oh, I don't want that job, I don't want this person. And we're always speaking in that negative, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. And God says, calm down. If I am in control of your life, you need to come to a place of peace and fulfillment knowing that I'm going to take you where you need to go, even though it may be a little uncomfortable, it's still going to do something amazing in your life as well. Listen to what the Bible says, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and those who carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. That's what Jesus is saying this morning. For those of you who are overwhelmed and you're weary as you're facing those difficult situations, there is an invitation that Jesus is giving out. He says, come to me. Come, come. As you come to me, I will give you rest. As you come to me, I will give you a divine exchange of your problems for my peace in your life as well. And this is what we need to do as children of God. Our attitude should be, God, I'm trusting you. I know that you are in control of my life. I may not understand everything that is happening in my life right now, but I believe you have my best interest in your heart, and I'm not going to go around resisting and fighting and struggling. I'm going to relax and enjoy the journey because I know that you're going to get me where I need to be when I need to be there as well. That's a faith that a child of God has as well. And when we begin to pray prayers like that, it takes that weight of our shoulder that somehow we are responsible to change all our situations. There are times that you are in certain situations in your life, only God can change it. Only God can direct your steps, and you got to be at peace until God takes you out of that situation. you got to trust in Him to lead you and guide you through what you're going through as well. The Bible says in Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still, and know that I am God. You know, so the revelation of God comes after being still. The Bible doesn't say, know that I am God, be still. The Bible says, be still, and then you will know that I am God. So much of our fidgeting and so much of our struggling and fighting 
to try to get out of our situation is actually hindering us from having a revelation of God in the midst of our circumstance. Did you know that? Right now, the situation that you're going through could be allowed by God so that you would have a new revelation of who God is and what He can do in your life. And as long as you're fighting and struggling and, and moaning and complaining, you're not going to experience the God that wants to reveal Himself to you in a special way. And God says, I want you to be still. Rest in me. Come to me. Give it to me. And as you stay still in my presence, then I'm going to reveal to you who I am. I will fight your battles. I will do great things for you in your life as you remain still. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. It says, For only we who believe can enter his rest. Yeah? For only we who believe can enter his rest. Meaning, the rest that God is talking about is for people who trust in the name of Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, he says that you then qualify for the rest that he gives. It means that you may have a situation that you don't understand, but you're not constantly trying to figure it out. It means, you know, there may be a dream in your heart, but you're not in a hurry. You're not frustrated because it hasn't come to fruition. In other words, you are really at a place where you're saying, I know that God is in control of my life, and I am in the palm of his hands, and God will do for me what he wants to do for me and the time that he chooses to do so as well. That's what the writer says, for those who come to him, is rest. And I'm, I'm not saying that you're going to face that situation for the rest of your life. You know, that situation that you're in right now, it's not a death sentence over you. It may be for a season. It may be for a time of duration until God completes the work that he intends to do in your life through that situation. You're going to go through that situation. But I tell you this one thing. Soon the night will end and the day will begin. Soon, the season of weeping will end and the season of rejoicing will begin. You just hold on in that season that you're in, in the hope and the trust, when the time comes, God will do for you what he promised he will do for you. That's our faith. Now, this is a confidence for every child of God that we have a God who has a power to work all things for good in our life as well. He has the power to even take the evil that someone has done in your life and still turn it around for good in your life. That's what the Bible says. He has the ability to take what other people meant for evil and turn it around for good. He will use whatever comes into your life for your good. He will use your difficulty to do a work in your life, what you're facing currently may not be good, but if you keep the right attitude, it'll turn for good in your life. Amen. If you're seated you say, you know, Pastor, you don't understand my circumstances. I'm doing the right things, but the wrong things are happening to me. I'm in a horrible marriage, and people are not treating me right. I want to tell you this morning, just because... You're facing a tough situation or you're going through a difficulty does not give us the right to lose our hope and our confidence in our God. Hear me out here. Just because you're going through something difficult, just because there's something really challenging that you're facing does not give you the right to lose your hope and your faith in Jesus Christ because he is a God who said he will never ever fail there has never ever been a track record where God did not come through for people who put their trust in him you know take Joseph for example he's sitting in prison you know pretty much for 13 years and serving time for a crime that he did not commit he was falsely accused he was put in that place because someone decided they're going to, you know, mess with him. And here's Joseph sitting in prison, and he makes this decision. He says, I am not going to sit here whining and moaning about how everything is going wrong in my life and how God is out to get me. No, no, no. While I'm in prison, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maximize the season. I'm going to walk with joy. I'm going to take every opportunity that comes my way. In the prison, I'm going to be the best prisoner there ever was so that I will get commendations as a best prisoner, and I'm going to enjoy being a prisoner. Hallelujah. I'm going to enjoy being a prisoner. I'm going to enjoy this demotion. 
Your boss calls you and says, you're not going to get the promotion. I'm going to give the person who's least qualified your promotion and say, thank you so much. I am so glad for this demotion because God is about to do something great in my life. Every time there is a setback in your life, it is a guarantee it is God getting ready to do something in your life. And that's basically what happened in Joseph's life. Every time the enemy pushed him further and further, God was like taking like, you know, a, a, a string that was being pulled attention. He was going to go further. That's what happens with an arrow. That's what happens when you pull further and further. That means the release is going to be much more stronger. Which means in your life, if there's great tension, if there's great challenges and great problems, be a great cheer. Because when God is done with you, He will release you into your destiny, into your future, and you would never thought what would ever happen in your life. As Joseph is rotting in prison and it looks like everyone had forgotten him, God was just pulling the tension. He says, Joseph, my time is yet to come, but you hang in there, you stay where you are, and when I release you, I'm going to release you to the top. But that's what God can do in your life. When you stay at peace in the situation that you're in and say, God, I'm not going to survive this. I'm going to thrive in this place. I'm going to be glad. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to walk in every day full of the joy of the Lord. Even though people will think that they have done me wrong, they're going to look at my face and wonder if I'm crazy because the joy of the Lord is always going to be my strength. I'm not going to let people or circumstances or situations dictate my emotion because I have a God who is in control of all circumstances in my life. And as long as I am his child, I have confidence that God will work for good all things in my life as well. You know, you may be frustrated this morning. Oh, I'm not married yet. You feel like you're stuck while everyone around you is moving on. You know, you're beginning to feel anxiety and you're afraid. Are you going to miss out on all the lot, lot of good things? But I want to tell you today, relax. Be at peace. Enjoy your season of singleness. Because when it goes, it goes. Come on, come on, someone. You, you can't do what you want to do when you're married. So you enjoy the season of singleness. You know, the, lot, the more you get frustrated and the more you begin to, you know, get annoyed and say, God, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Do this, do that, oh God. And you begin bombarding God with all your prayers and stuff. You might actually be the cause for the delay. Some of you, some of the prayers that you make for, to God about your spouse, God looks at the 25 list that you have made and says, I can't find anyone on earth that would fit this kind of person you're looking for. Some, some Christians, I, you know, I hear some of the young people, oh, she needs to have long black hair that's about 26 inches. She needs to be this high. She needs to have done this doctorate. She needs to have gone here. And then I was like, God cannot find that kind of person even if he created one of those people. You, your prayer should be, God, I want to find someone who loves Jesus. Even if they don't have teeth, as long as they love Jesus, I'm happy. So, uh, okay, it's all right. You can get teeth. You know, we live in a day, in an age where they can put dentures on and make them look good. You know, but a lot of us, we try to dictate to God what he needs to do in our life. That's not how it works. God wants us to submit to him to allow him to do what he wants to do. A lot of us, we come to God and we say, God, I want you to give me this job there and that place and this pay. God says, come on, stop. If you're going to trust me with leading your life, then let me take care of the business. Because when I'm done with you, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are better than your thoughts. Even in your wildest dream, you will never imagine what I'm about to do. So you just hold on in faith. Trust me to lead you through and I will give you better than the things that you ever dreamed would ever happen in your life as well. That's what I tell you young people. If you trust God, say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to throw that list in the, in the garbage. And I'm, going to, I'm just going to love you. And I believe that you're going to give me the right partner. He'll give you a person that is beyond your wildest dreams. Because sometimes our list actually limits on from giving you the best. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, you want this person? Or I had someone better. But since you asked this one, I'll give it to you, this one. God says, trust in me. I will work things out for good. You know... One of the things that I constantly teach myself to do as I walk with Jesus is to make this a prayer that's daily, where I say, God, not my will, but yours. Today, not the things that I desire, but the things that you desire, let it happen in my life. You know, I want you 
to open the right doors in my life. I want you to bring the right people into my life. Remove the people that need to be removed from my life. And help me to walk in the place that you want me to walk. And the more we begin to make prayers like that, you know, the more God begins to cause things to happen in our life for good. I love the scripture, Romans 8, 28. You know, it's a promise that you need to remind yourself often. We all know the scripture. God causes everything to work together for good. Did you know that? Underline or circle that word causes. There's no one else who can cause except God. The Bible says, for God causes everything to work together for good. For who? For who? For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you love Jesus, if you're walking where he wants you to walk, he will turn everything around for good. That's your joy. Every morning when you wake up and say, even if the whole world comes against me, my God is in control of everything and he can still turn things around for good in my life. That's our joy. Here's an interesting thing. I have learned in my life, we don't grow in the good times, we grow in the hard times. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, last year, some of you walked through certain journeys which were so difficult. Your heart was broken. Your faith was challenged. You felt like, what is going to happen in my life? And in those moments are the moments when those roots go a little deeper, where your faith becomes stronger in God, where you begin to have this resolve, come what may, I'm not going to give up. You know, sometimes when we just, everything is blue skies and, and rosy, it kind of makes our roots shallow. When things are hard, when there is a challenge that is against us, it's almost like, you know, there's a, uh, uh, a kind of mechanism that God put inside of us, a human psyche, if I may, that kind of resolves to be determined when things get harder. Have you ever felt that? You know, everything is going fine, and when things get harder, you say, ah, all right, now that everything is hard, I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm going to get this done. And I've seen this even in the history of the church. Every time the church was left alone, it kind of got, bleh. People just, you know, became complacent about God and people didn't really get passionate. But the moment someone messed with the church, kind of, you know, prodded the church a little bit, do you know what happens? Church begins to become resolute. It begins to become one. and says, we're not going to give up. We believe in this too much. We're not going to give in to this. And we begin to hold on when there's trouble. Come on, shake your neighbor and say, when there's pain, there's growth. That's why we call it the growing pains. Have you ever heard that term, the growing pains? Because that shows when there's pain, there's something growing. You are in the process of, of maturing in Jesus Christ. Can I make a confession to you this morning? Oh, no? Okay, good. You're such sweet people. You don't want me to confess anything. I really dislike exercising. I do not enjoy working out. It hurts in so many ways, in so many places. <laughs> if someone invents a pill that can produce a six pack, I'll be the first one in the queue to get that. <laughs> My wife, she reminds me when I'm moaning and aching the next day from the pain of the workout, she tells me that it's a good pain. She reminds me, you know, when I'm, you know, coming down the stairs and every, every step is like, oh, 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 I'm just coming down. Like, it hurts, it hurts. She's like, it's a good kind of pain. It's a good pain. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's some good pain and there's bad pain. <laughs> when you're going through something difficult, it's a good pain because it's going to do something in you because the pain is telling me that when I worked out, my muscles were torn. Right? That's basically what happens for those who are workout geeks. When you pull out, pull, you know, do all your pull-ups and push-ups, the muscle tears. All right? And the muscle kind of, you know, gets destroyed when you work out. But then the next day, what the muscle does, it rebuilds itself. And the rebuilding is what causes pain. Did you know that? If the muscle didn't rebuild, you wouldn't have pain. And you wouldn't have a muscle either. 
But the reason you have pain is because the muscle is rebuilding itself. And get this, when it rebuilds itself, it gets stronger than what it was before. Because when it was torn down, now it's rebuilding, it gets a little stronger. And you keep doing it, and your muscle gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and you begin to get a six-pack. That's what's been happening in my life. <laughs> Even though you may not see it, you need, you need to have faith, calling those things that are not as though they were. You need to have eyes of faith when you see it. It's like whenever I push my body to go through pain, I'm telling myself I'm getting stronger. Tomorrow, when I face this pain, it's a reminder to me that my muscle is going to be stronger when it's done. And every time you go through something difficult, every time there's a setback, every time your faith is challenged, you're telling yourself, I'm going to come out of this stronger. My faith in God is going to be built. I'm going to be a stronger Christian because of what I'm going through in my life as well. When there is hurt, there is growth. When there is pain, it produces something. And that's what happens in the kingdom of God. When there is pain, it produces the work of God in our lives as well. If God is allowing you to go through something painful, that means he's preparing you for something great. But if you're kicking and fighting and won't allow him to do what he wants to do, you're only going to prolong the process. It's going to be longer. You're not going to get through. And, and, and in that moment of situation, when you're going through something, it's to hold on to your faith and to be determined. And a lot of us, we consider faith to be a magic wand. You know, just wave the faith and say, abracadabra, go away. There are incidents, please um, don't misquote me. The Bible does teach us when we speak in faith to the mountain, let it be removed, it will be removed. There are times when God allows our faith to operate in that level, in that way. But most of the time what happens is the reason why we go through difficulty is to build and test our faith. So the faith becomes stronger. So the faith becomes resilient. And a lot of times, you know, there's a reason why God doesn't answer our prayer. Because if he did... He would compromise the greater fulfillment for what he's about to do. There are a lot of times there is what I would call divine delays. There are certain things that God won't give it to you now because he knows when he gives it to you tomorrow, it'll be better for you. And so some of us, we're frustrated with God because we're not getting what we want when we want. And God says, that's not how it goes. I will give you what you need when you need it as long as you walk in faith and trust in me. Because if I give something to you too soon, it's going to destroy you. It's going to cause more harm and damage than actually will help build you up. It's like giving your child a, a drill for their third birthday. Oh, here you go. Here's a Bosch power drill for you. Just go ahead and drill something in our home. They'll kill themselves. Because it's not meant for them at that age. There's some things that God doesn't mean for you to have until you come to a certain level of maturity and faith. And when you come to that place is when God gives you access and grants to that place as well. Do you know that? And until that season comes, we just are impatient. We have to be patient, holding in faith for the things that God promised. He is using what you're currently going through to get you ready for what he's about to do. I'll say it again. He's using what you're currently going through to get you ready for what he's about to do in your life. If your prayers are not being answered the way you want them on your timetable, it doesn't mean that God is angry with you or that he's trying to punish you. You have to get a bigger vision than that. Maybe it's because God has something incredibly better in store for you than what you're asking for. Maybe he's protecting you from what is ahead of you, you know? Or maybe God is trying to, you know, work you into a much, much greater level than what you thought would happen as well. You know, don't say things like, you know, God never answers my prayers. God never does what I want him to do. Sometimes Christians say these things. God never does anything I ask him to do. Maybe God is answering your prayer by not giving you what you want. Have you ever thought about that? You know, I'm so glad that God can answer all my prayers. Have you ever been there when you've prayed some stupid prayers? <laughs> I remember when I was a young, you know, in my 20s. I'm not going to confess those things to you this morning. 
I'm just going to leave it at that. I, there are some things I prayed for, and today I look back and say, I'm so glad, God, you saw past my foolishness and did not answer that prayer, because if you had, I would not be where I am today. God's not going to answer some of your prayers because he knows where you need to be tomorrow. And for you to be there tomorrow, he needs to abstain certain things from your life so that you can get to where he wants you to be as well. And just because there's no answer to your prayer does not mean God does not love you. A lot of times we equate God's answer to prayers to his love. That's not how it works. God loves us whether he gives us anything good or not. He is a good God, regardless. He's a good God who does good things. And even if you don't see it, even if you don't feel it, even if you don't experience it, God will do good things in your life. God knows what's best for you. And even if you don't know what's best for you, God knows because he's your heavenly father and he will never give you anything that will take you away from what he wants to do in your life that is greater and better as well. Come on, give him a hand of praise and say, thank you, Lord. You know, I've, I've seen people jump into relationships and business deals because they're so desperate, even though they don't feel good about it. You know, I've sat with young people within our congregation, and I could sense the hesitancy in, in their hearts for what they're about to do. And I'm trying to tell them, don't do it, but there's, you know, this sense of pressure that they feel from society or family or whatever it is that they want to do this. And, you know, sometimes people pressure or strong harm God into allowing them to do what God, but what they want to do. And God is a gentleman, all right? If you're going to pressure him and strong harm him to ask him to give you permission to do something, he's just going to let you do it. And there's some of you who are living in, 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 in your life today as a result of strong arming God into letting you do something. And God says, hey, I told you, hang in there. But for those of you who are in that season, there's good news for you as well because God is able to reverse and God is able to rebuild and God is able to restore back to you whatever it's lost. But the better approach is, God, I'm going to trust you for the best, even if it means waiting a little bit longer. Because here's the truth, church. If anyone believes in your success, it's God. If anyone desires for you to be absolutely victorious is God. More than your dad, more than your mom, more than your best friend, more than your husband, more than your wife, God has greater investment in you and in your life for your success. And God is the greatest champion for your life as well. You gotta remember that. When you're running this race of life, he is out there on the stands and he's cheering you on and says, come on, you can do it. You can go through what you're going through because I'm here for you and God is getting us through because he is our greatest champion. Because sometimes people see God as though he's the obstacle for what's happening in their life. Actually, God is the one who is cheering you on to finish the work that he started in your life as well. Proverbs 3, 6, well-known scripture. says, if you acknowledge God in all your ways, he will direct your path. Another translation says, he'll crown your efforts with success. I like that one. Now, when you acknowledge him and when you give it to him, he will crown your efforts efforts with success. Some of you who are frustrated with what, what you're going through and what you're facing, this is a, a word for you this morning. Stir up your faith. Hang in there. Hold on to the promises of God because he is a God who is faithful to do what he said he would do. The Bible says, though heaven and earth may pass away, his word shall remain eternal. Everything around you can crumble and fail, but the words that God has spoken, it will never cease. It will always be. Every word that came out of God's mouth, it never goes back to him void. It always accomplishes and fulfills that thing for which God sent it out to. So it means there are words that God has spoken over your life. You can be confident that it will not go back to God until it finishes what God intended for it to finish in your life as well. Because <laughs> I like to call this the God of the suddenly. Yeah? There are times when you feel like you're in it, 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 and then suddenly you're not in it. Some of you are like that in this situation. I want to tell you, we have a God of the suddenlies, meaning when he begins to activate. 
when he begins to move, no one can stop what he wants to do. No doctor's report can contradict what God wants to do in your life. Come on, someone. No person can stop the plan and the purpose of God. Not your boss, not your CEO. If God wanted to give you a promotion, there's no one who can stop you from getting a promotion. If God wants you to get somewhere, no one's going to stop you. If God wants you to go abroad, no immigration officer can say no to you because if he wills it, he will make it happen. And that's your hope and my hope that suddenly there will come a time in a season when the timing of God will begin to work out in your life as well. You just have to stay strong until that moment that he is intended for you comes to pass in your life as well. You know, the prayer that we need to constantly make is, Lord, give me the strength to go through what I'm going through. Give me the grace to endure the things that are in front of me especially during times of, of difficulty and seasons where, where you're, you feel like you're, you're struggling, this is a prayer you can make. Say, God, it's difficult, but I'm going to ask you to give me strength. Give me strength to go through this situation, to get through what I'm going through, because you can decide whether you will either be a victim of your situation or if you're going to be a victor over your circumstances. And it's all about your attitude. You know, you got to stop being depressed for those of you who are this morning, say, ah, oh, you know, I've just given up on things. I've given up on God. Stop doing that. Put your trust back in God. Put your hope back in God's word. Begin to walk in faith again. Begin to, to start having the, the mentality of someone who's victorious and say, God will make it happen in my life. All things will come together in my life. God's season and timing will happen in me. And you begin to declare in faith and you begin to walk in faith. And when you begin to make a word of declaration, the faith declaration, I tell you, church, there's power when we declare things through our words because you have the ability to create things in your life. And when the moment of that, you know, desertness that you're in, when you begin to declare the word of God, hope begins to arise, and where you're surviving, you suddenly find yourself thriving, and where you thought you're not going to make it, you suddenly know you're going to make it, because the moment you begin to declare God's word through your mouth, there's power of God that is released into that situation circumstance as well. I love this scripture in Psalm 84, verse 6, and I'll finish with this. It says, as I go through the valley of weeping, because God is with me, it will become a place of refreshing. You know, my valley of Baca is going to be turned into streams of refreshing. What was meant to kill you will be the very same thing that's going to build you to become stronger in your faith and in what God wants to do in your life as well. This morning, I'm encouraging you. Don't have the mentality of, you know, I'm just going to survive until I get through what I'm going through. No, no, make the decision. Even if it's a difficult situation in my life, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to walk in joy. I'm going to thrive in this season because I have a God who is in absolute control of my life. And when God is in control, I don't need to worry about anything. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise for he is good, worthy to be praised. Hallelujah.